The notion of superbosses has significantly evolved over the years. In the earlier days of the Final Fantasy franchise, they were introduced as a way for players to test themselves beyond the limits of the expected beaten path. But as the franchise developed, they became a purposeful part of the experience, and their inclusion started to become a much more elaborate affair. Within the two previous episodes of our exploration into the evolution of superbosses, we have deconstructed every superboss to have appeared within the original Final Fantasy all the way up to before Crisis Final Fantasy VII. Numerous traits were identified, such as an intriguing association with summons, that superbosses started to become multi-fight and multi-enemy encounters, and that even finding them was an undertaking in itself. If you're coming in fresh, we therefore recommend checking out part 1 and part 2 via the links in the description below, so that you can get up to speed, and so you can understand some of the references that will be made throughout this video. But with that in mind, let's continue to explore the complete evolution of Superbosses. After being announced in 2001, the initial plan was for Final Fantasy XII to be released at some point during 2003. But with numerous issues happening behind the scenes that included, but were not limited to, Square merging with Enix, and Hironobu Sakaguchi, the executive producer, and Yasumi Matsuno, the director, also leaving the company, numerous delays were inevitable. Final Fantasy XII would end up releasing in Japan on the 16th of March 2006, three years after the initial planned shipment date. This was a huge shame for everyone who was anticipating the game. But the positive was that it afforded the development team much more time to create supplemental content. One of the major areas where this shone through was with hunts. Final Fantasy X had introduced the notion of hunts through the monster arena. After a certain volume of monsters had been captured, a unique variant would be created that posed a greater challenge, and this then worked all the way up to the creation of Nemesis, the strongest enemy in the original Japanese and North American release of the game. Final Fantasy XI then took this further through the creation of notorious monsters. These were tough variants of standard enemies, or indeed wholly original enemies, that spawned in the wild and were effectively hunted down by avid players and sometimes even full-on alliances. Final Fantasy XII then took these elements and formalised them into the game's narrative via the hunt system. The tutorial hunt would see the players tasked with tracking down and defeating an enemy called Rogue Tomato, an evolved form of the deadly nightshade enemy type. This initial foray was not meant to pose any real obstacle, but as more and more hunts unlocked, so too did the associated challenge. And this then culminated with a final hunt dubbed Farewell to a Legend. Even though Yasumi Matsuno had left partway through the development of Final Fantasy XII, there was still a fondness amongst the developers who remained. Some had been with Matsuno since his days at Quest, where he worked on Tactics Ogre, while others had collaborated on games such as Final Fantasy Tactics and Vagrant Story. This hunt was their in-game way of paying tribute to Matsuno, as the creature being hunted, as well as its in-game lore, had application that paralleled real life. Yesmat was considered to be the most powerful dragon ever created designed to guard a sacred blade. But, despite there being a lot of reverence amongst Yasmat's contemporaries, it was driven to madness and became a threat to its creator. This then led to Yasmat killing the very deity that gave it life, and Mont Blanc posted the hunt petition as a way of seeking revenge, as with the deity destroyed, life had a lot less joy. This law positioned Yasmat as an ancient being, and due to its demise, it was, in some ways, quite similar to Ozma. Numerous superbosses have been created over the years with the purpose of defending something, with perhaps the most prominent examples being the weapons. Ozma, too, fell into this category, as it was once an Eidolon associated with a tearing crystal, but after becoming corrupted, it posed a much greater threat. Yasmat was also encounterable in a specific location, the Colosseum in the Ridorana Cataract, and similar to Ozma, the location was neither the game's penultimate or final dungeon, nor could the superboss be found wandering around the world map. The encounter itself would be nothing like that against Ozma though, or indeed any other superboss ever faced before in the franchise, except perhaps those from the earlier days of Final Fantasy XI. And that was because it revolved around a lengthy war of attrition, 
Yazmat had 50 million HP, and with regular attacks unable to break the damage limit in the original version of Final Fantasy XII, this meant it took a considerable amount of time to deal enough damage to succeed. On top of this, Yazmat also posed a considerable threat. It could deal mass damage and displayed an element of adaptability, and this too manifested in a similar manner to Ozma. For example, should the party attempt to create distance, Yazmat would alter its strategy. Due to the reduced perceived threat, recovery would be prioritized, and this would be supplemented through use of defensive and offensive self-buffs. But Yazmat would also adjust its offensive arsenal, and this then highlighted a loose connection with the first generation superbosses, which often featured instant death abilities, as Yazmat would start using more instant death attacks. The other intriguing parallel with Ozma could use attack charge time zero to work outside of the constraints that were applied to the player. Whereas Ozma could take actions without having a full ATB bar, attack charge time zero meant Yazmat could attack with no charge time applied. Further to these elements relating to adaptability, Yazmat also adopted specific phases. Similar to some other super bosses such as Brachio Rhydos or Penance, this meant Yazmat changed its strategy after its health dropped to certain levels. But despite all of Yazmat's strengths, there were weaknesses, and one of them created a further association with Ozma, as it was weak to the Dark Element, Final Fantasy XII's equivalent of Shadow. By exploiting this weakness and establishing an ironclad gambit strategy, Yazmat could be defeated with relative ease by players via automation. But that should not negate the challenge offered, as players could spend hours scrying off against Yazmat and have one mistake prove costly. And to make matters worse, if they retreated for too long, Yazmat would start to regenerate health. Now, Due to how iconic Yazmat has become, it's often easy to forget that Final Fantasy XII featured another super boss. And the intriguing element here is that it had a very loose connection with both Yazmat and also one of the very first super bosses. Omega Mark XII could be encountered inside the Great Crystal, and despite its strength, it was not classified as a predetermined hunt. But that's where the connection with Yazmat came in, as Omega Mark XII could only be encountered once the hunt to defeat Yazmat had been accepted. This then mirrored many previous superbosses that were connected to one another through various means, such as Ultima Weapon and Ruby Weapon, or even Tremor and Paragon. But due to Yazmat not needing to be defeated for Omega Mark XII to appear, the relationship between the two superbosses was more akin to that witness between Hades and Ozma in Final Fantasy IX. There, the two superbosses were independent from one another, but there were law and mechanical connections between the two, and that's what was seen here. In terms of the actual boss, it was designed to pay reference to both the original pseudo superboss as well as one of the original true superbosses. This came through via its name, Omega Mark XII, as well as its designation as an ancient war mech. But if this wasn't clear enough, its in-game lore description noted that Omega Mark XII had used rifts to travel between dimensions. The other curious connection here was that the developers brought back the ability to flee, but in Final Fantasy V, this trait was associated with Shinryu, not Omega. It would, however, drop the Omega badge upon being defeated, and as if to combine with Shinryu again, this piece of loot could actually be used to create the Dragon Crest aka the Worm Hero Blade, one of the strongest swords in the game. In and around the merger between Square and Enix, the company sought to remake and remaster some of the older 8-bit and 16-bit games as a way of introducing them to newer generations and delivering nostalgia for those who played the original versions. But they didn't just stick to updating the graphics and visuals and making gameplay tweaks. It saw Final Fantasy 1, 2 and 4 all given quite extensive treatment, and each had new super bosses introduced as a way of providing extra value for returning players. Final Fantasy 3 was also intended to receive the same treatment, but due to a myriad of issues behind the scenes, it kept getting postponed. In the end, as so much time had passed, it no longer felt appropriate to release a game that would have been akin to Final Fantasy 3 Advance. Instead, the decision was taken to produce something much broader in scope. 
a full 3D remake that would stay faithful to the original game but adapt it for the expectations of modern audiences. This meant significant changes were made to the narrative and core gameplay systems. Of course, it also meant that an original Superboss was snuck into the mix, and just like in the Dawn of Souls releases of Final Fantasy 1 and 2, it paid tribute to the past. The Iron Giants could be found within a purpose-built hidden dungeon called the Iron Giants Cave, and this dungeon would only be available after an extensive quest had been completed relating to Mognet. When the Iron Giant appeared as a pseudo superboss in the Famicom version of Final Fantasy II, it was notorious for its high defensive attributes and high damage output that saw it deliver the equivalent of 12 physical attacks per turn. The high defense was retained here, and an aspect of the physical damage was retained too, as the Iron Giant was able to perform 4 actions for every one turn. What made this even more devilish was that the Iron Giant only had 3 potential attacks. It could deliver a standard attack, use Swipe, which delivered double physical damage to every party member, or use Meteor, which would deal non-elemental magical damage. After its HP was reduced, it would then adjust its strategy to only using Swipe, and this meant the Iron Giant could deliver huge amounts of physical damage to the entire party every turn. Many would be unable to survive this assault, and it meant strict strategies would need to be employed to ensure success. Soon after the release of Final Fantasy III on the DS, the Advance series continued on the Game Boy Advance with Final Fantasy V. And for this particular iteration, the original two super bosses were supplemented by enhanced versions. Even though many super bosses had appeared throughout the franchise by this point, they had almost always been either unique or serving as a direct tribute to another previous super boss. Final Fantasy V Advance therefore served as an intriguing evolution of this concept as the developers created brand new iterations of the two super bosses that already existed, and they could both be found within a new bonus dungeon called the Sealed Temple. These new iterations were dubbed Omega Mark II and Neo Shinryu, and although there were distinct similarities to their predecessors, both featured significant enhancements. Omega Mark II, for example, in addition to everything accessible to Omega, could now use barrier change to adjust its elemental weakness with it absorbing all other elements. And Neo Shinryu, in addition to everything accessible to Shinryu, now had two distinct forms, and this determined its attributes and its vulnerabilities. These changes seemed quite small on paper, but they led to a significant increase in difficulty. However, even though the challenge was enhanced, Omega Mark II and Neo Shinryu only served as appetizers for the game's true superboss, Enuo. Depicted as an ancient being who existed thousands of years before the main events of Final Fantasy V, Enuo was once immortal, before trading that gift for control of the Void. Enuo planned to use the Void to conquer worlds, but he was defeated by brave warriors who wielded the sealed weapons that could be found in the main game inside the sealed castle. And this was an interesting note. Amongst the pantheon of superbosses covered so far in this series, very few had suffered a previous defeat that led to it being sealed away. Outside of the likes of Angramainu, the majority of superbosses were purpose-built creations that had never been overcome before. What makes this interesting is that this particular lore note often ended up being foreboding, as even though super bosses like Enuo had been defeated before, they had not been vanquished. In the case of Enuo, he was sealed inside a temple to prevent further harm, and after gaining access to the location themselves, the party could encounter Enuo inside the temple's farthest reaches. The encounter then proved to be one of the most challenging to date. One of the distinctions here was that similar to some other super bosses, such as Ruby Weapon and Penance, Enuo had multiple parts that could take actions. However, during the first phase of the fight, they could not be targeted. Enuo also had two separate forms. In the first, its main body of attacks would revolve around high level elemental and non elemental spells. But once this form had been defeated, the multiple parts would disappear and a new, even stronger form would appear and this was here we'd see more of the hallmarks of the super boss. For example, Enuo would start using blue magic, with one of the most prominent being level 5 death, and this had not been seen since it was last used by Ozma. Enuo could also be somewhat adaptive, able to deliver a variety of counters. 
Perhaps the most intriguing point around Inuo though came with its multiple forms, as outside of simply being able to use a different array of abilities, the second form benefited from having enhanced stats, and this meant its regular attacks dealt more damage but that it could also take actions on a more frequent basis. Final Fantasy VI Advance was released not too long after, and it followed a similar approach to Final Fantasy V Advance. This meant that instead of adding a random super boss that had more of a connection to the wider franchise than the actual game itself, the original plan was resurfaced, and this meant the Kaiser Dragon returned. Similar to other remastered super bosses, the Kaiser Dragon could be found at the conclusion of a brand new dungeon called the Dragon's Den. But to gain access, players would first need to defeat the eight legendary dragons. By now, these notions have become par for the course, as many super bosses were housed within bonus dungeons, and many had required the player to defeat a gluttony of weaker enemies. The notion of multi-phase or multi-form encounters had also started to become more commonplace. But the Kaiser Dragon upped the ante here by having five separate forms and multiple phases. Each form would have 65,500 HP, but after seeing that reduced or having too much time pass, the Kaiser Dragon would use Barrier Change, a move only just used by Omega Mark II in Final Fantasy V Advance. When this happened, the Kaiser Dragon would then reset its HP back up to 65,500 and a new attack phase would commence. Similar to Brachioridos, there was no set order as to which phase would be used when the new form came into place, and the Kaiser Dragon actually had 9 individual attack patterns that could be used at any given phase. The only thing that was set was that after the fourth use of the barrier change ability, the Kaiser Dragon would then use its final attack pattern until its eventual demise. This then saw the return of a long dormant trait, the association between super bosses and summons as after defeating the Kaiser Dragon, players would be granted access to the Diablos Magicite. But this wasn't the only trait to resurface, as there was a direct connection between the Kaiser Dragon and another superboss called Omega Weapon. Should the player return to the Kaiser's lair after the defeat of the Kaiser Dragon, they would find Omega Weapon in its place. And similar to Final Fantasy VIII and X, this iteration of Omega Weapon served as an upgraded version of Ultima Weapon from the core game. But despite appearing in place of the Kaiser Dragon, it was much less harsh in terms of the challenge posed. By the end of the Game Boy Advance era, numerous 8-bit and 16-bit games had been remade and remastered. Some of them had even been through numerous iterations, but although new content had almost always been added at each and every opportunity, there had only ever been one new wave of super bosses added per game. That was, until the release of the 20th anniversary edition of the original Final Fantasy. Alongside the original suite of super bosses that were introduced with the Dawn of Souls edition, this saw the developers craft a devilish new super boss called Chronodia. And perhaps to emphasise the nature of Chronodia's arrival as part of the 20th anniversary celebration, it was quite unlike any super boss ever seen before. After making their way through a new bonus dungeon called the Labyrinth of Time, players would need to solve numerous puzzles, and their success would then change the conclusion of the dungeon, and this was where the uniqueness of Chronodia came to the fore. Every previous super boss had been preset and individual. Players could sometimes make small tweaks to alter the battle in some way, such as adjusting Osma's elemental weakness, or there being a degree of randomness via individual abilities or specific attack patterns, such as was just seen with the Kaiser Dragon. This helped to make each attempt different from the last, especially with the Kaiser Dragon, as with there being 9 different potential attack patterns, encountering the same exact string of attack patterns throughout the encounter was uncommon. But ultimately, Ozma was still Ozma, and the Kaiser Dragon was still the Kaiser Dragon. Chronodia, however, was not always the same Chronodia. Due to the volume of puzzles and the amount of combinations that arose based on the completion status of those puzzles, players could square off against 8 different iterations of Chronodia and each one was unique. The basic version of Chronodia, for example, would be fought against if the player failed to solve any of the puzzles. It featured 30,000 HP and appeared as a single entity that was capable of using some frustrating status effects including Seal which locked out a specific command and used powerful physical attacks. As more puzzles were completed, 
more powerful iterations of Chronodia were unlocked and then faced at the end of the dungeon. But the power didn't just come from increased attributes and an expanded array of abilities. Each iteration of Chronodia would be bolstered by an ally, and the effect was somewhat cumulative. The first four iterations saw Chronodia supported by one of the four fiends from the core game, and each four fiend granted Chronodia access to a unique array of abilities associated to that four fiend. Lich, for example, offered access to Flare and Kill, an instant death move capable of killing anyone without resistance who happened to be under 300 HP, while Kraken granted access to Ink. The 6th and 7th iterations of Chronodia then saw support by two Four Fiends at the same time, but it was the 8th iteration that represented the true challenge. Alongside having the highest HP and attributes across the board, Chronodia would have access to the moves of all the Four Fiends, as well as some of those associated with Chaos itself. It meant Chronodia served as the ultimate representation of a superboss, as not only did it draw on the power of the core game's strongest enemies, it also had eight different variants that each needed to be defeated in order to complete the game's bestiary. As a pseudo-sequel to Final Fantasy XII, Revenant Wings served as an extension of the wider narrative, but as the developers were keen to take advantage of the capabilities of the Nintendo DS, they decided to make a drastic shift in genre. Instead of being a traditional role-playing game, this saw Revenant Wings transformed into a real-time strategy game. But the impressive aspect was that many of the core Final Fantasy XII mechanics, such as gambits and quickenings, were carried over. Something else that was carried over was the game's resident superboss, Yismat. But even though it was still a very strong enemy and retained instant kill capabilities, it was nowhere near as strong as the Final Fantasy XII incarnation. One intriguing aspect, however, was that Yismat could be found within a secret dungeon called Midlight's Deep, and this served as a fitting nod back to Final Fantasy Tactics, where that game's superboss, Elidibus, could also be encountered at the end of Midlight's Deep. Not long after the release of Final Fantasy XII, Square Enix also released the third expansion for Final Fantasy XI. Unlike the two previous expansions, this represented the first time an expansion had launched simultaneously around the world, and it afforded the developers more opportunities to be creative. It saw a whole new region created, with new collaborative gameplay modes introduced such as Assault and Besieged, and of course, it meant that alongside three new jobs, there was plenty of room for new enemies. Some of these, such as Cerberus and Hydra, were very challenging but underwhelmed compared to previous encounters, and that sentiment would remain until mid-2007, upon the expanded release of Yunheya. Similar to Dynamis, this would see a huge group of players tackle challenges of increasing difficulty, and the objective was to progress through the Wing Chambers to access the Valgrind, where Odin awaited. This had shades of many previous superbosses, where lesser encounters had to be overcome before facing the greater challenge, and Odin served as a fitting conclusion. Similar to previous Final Fantasy XI superbosses, the initial foray against Odin within Odin's chamber would see the dangerous foe summon numerous allies at intervals throughout the fight, and these came in the shape of Fomers, or undead manifestations of the player races. Alongside this, Odin used numerous abilities, sometimes at specific health depletion milestones, while others would be dependent on the mode adopted after the use of Sangatal. And this made Odin quite similar to Brachio Rhydos from Final Fantasy IV Advance, which could change its playstyle throughout the encounter. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of the fight, however, was the use of Zantetsken. As expected, based on the previous utility of this ability, it was designed to deliver an instant KO to any players within range. This then revisited the association between superbosses and instant death and when Odin first arrived within the game, it proved to be a real stumbling block to players due to its brutal efficiency. However, it wouldn't be long until, via some hints from the developers, the weakness of Zantetsken was identified. Any players who were using the heal command would be immune to instant death, taking magical damage instead. For the 20th anniversary edition of Final Fantasy II, the developers adopted a similar approach to what was seen with the same milestone release of the original Final Fantasy. But instead of adding one superboss to supplement the existing roster, they added two, and together they pulled from numerous superbosses from the distant past and more recent memory. 
Both Freakios and Yumion were found within a new bonus dungeon called the Arcane Labyrinth, and they were connected in much the same way as the likes of Tremor and Paragon. After making their way through the labyrinth, players would be greeted by Dumion at the High Altar, and he would summon forth Freakios to test their strength. Should they succeed, then Dumion would ask what they sought, and this was how the game's ultimate weapons were procured. This then saw reference paid to Chronodia, as Freakios had seven different incarnations, and which one the player fought against was determined by how many key terms the party knew. If, for example, the party knew four or less key terms, the weakest version of Freakios would be encountered. This version only had 800 HP, minimal offensive and defensive attributes, and could only perform standard attacks that were laced with venom. However, should the party work their way up to knowing all 15 key terms, they would face a very different version of Freakios. Would have 15,000 HP and defensive and defensive attributes that were four times as strong. But it also now had standard attacks that could cause instant death and access to some of the most powerful elemental spells and Starfall 16, which was only previously used by the Light Emperor in the Dawn of Souls iteration. Now, should the party defeat Freakios and then say they sought destruction, Jumion would then step forward. As the master of Freakios, Jumion had access to an expanded array of spells, but lacked the attributes to deal strong physical damage. As such, there was an Achilles heel, its MP pool. Should this be drained, Jumion's offensive potency would be reduced, and the encounter could be made much less intimidating. Final Fantasy XII became quite notorious within Superboss circles due to the inclusion of Yzmat. It challenged players in ways that were unorthodox, and it led to countless war stories being shared amongst communities. But even though Final Fantasy XII was a critical success, Hiroyuki Ito was not happy with how people chose to play the game. The license board and gambit system were designed to remove barriers. Ito felt previous systems had been too restrictive and wanted to open doors for creative thinking. But once Final Fantasy XII was released into the wild, he noticed that the opposite happened. Instead of developing each character to fill either a set or hybrid role in the party, players just developed every character as a carbon copy of one another. They also found optimal gambit system setups that could adapt to almost any scenario. In response, Ito vowed to make the enhanced version of Final Fantasy XII, dubbed Final Fantasy XII International Zodiac Job System, much more restrictive. Specific jobs were now introduced, and Ito even went so far as to prevent players from being able to change jobs, as he wanted the game to help people learn to start accepting the decisions they'd taken in their lives. But for those who still wanted to find optimal ways of succeeding, Ito and his team developed something a little extra called Trial Mode. Trial Mode was composed of 100 different stages that became progressively more difficult, and the game's original two super bosses, Yesmat and Omega Mark 12, appeared on stages 98 and 99. That then left stage 100 open to feature a brand new super boss, and it came in the form of the Judge Magisters. Similar to the Archangels from Final Fantasy XI, this fight challenged players by having them square off against not just one high-powered Judge Magister, but all five at the same time. Even Judge Drace and Judge Zargaboth, who were not fought against during the main game. With a combined HP pool of over 1 million, and the ability to act with complete autonomy from each other, this presented quite the challenge, especially because unlike the Archangels, where they were faced by a huge alliance, here, the Judge Magister needed to be faced by a selected party of just three members, and having just scraped through against Yzmat and a Mega Mark 12, which then brought back the notion of super bosses that were fought back to back with no break in between. Needless to say, though, this upped the ante compared to those previous super boss gauntlets, such as Paragon and Tremor, and to succeed, players would need to have a very strong strategy in place. Crisis Core arrived almost two years after Dirge of Cerberus, but instead of being a sequel to Final Fantasy VII, it served as a prequel. As such, players took control of Zack Fair as they sought to understand more about his uplifting and heartbreaking story. As one of the strongest members of Soldier, Zack Fair was a combat specialist, and to ensure players had their own skills tested, the developers created a super boss called Minerva. 
In previous Final Fantasy VII properties, super bosses were ancient beings created by the planet in order to fulfill some kind of role. Sometimes, such as in the case of Ruby and Emerald Weapon, this was to negate a threat. But in the case of Chaos, it was to ensure the long-term survival of the planet on the basis that the threat had probably won. Minerva was also connected to the planet, but instead of being created for some kind of task, it's implied that she represented the planet's consciousness, and as such, served as some kind of supernatural being that was of far greater strength and important than the likes of Weapon. After a brief cameo in the story, Minerva could then be challenged via the game's mission structure. Similar to previous games such as Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, as players progressed through enough missions, then they would start to unlock even more challenging ones. And the most challenging was mission 966 dubbed the Reigning Deity. Minerva stood as by far the strongest enemy in the game, featuring 10 million HP, 999,999 MP, and maximum attributes across the board. And these attributes could be channeled through horrible abilities such as Ultima and Judgment Arrow, which could remove MP, AP, and Zax buffs. Much of this was par for the course though in terms of challenging players within the established framework, but what made Minerva quite special against her super boss peers was the notion of difficulty. Chronodia and Freakios featured multiple iterations that differed in strength. To modify that strength, players would need to solve the puzzles that stood before them, but the expectation was that the challenge could be overcome based on that game's meta. Where Minerva differed was that a purpose-built upgrade was created that could only be accessible when playing on hard mode through a second playthrough, and to increase the challenge, Minerva was given double the maximum HP. Wings of the Goddess arrived as the fourth expansion for Final Fantasy XI towards the end of 2007 and it brought with it an array of new jobs, new missions, and of course, new enemies. But even though that was the case, content was still being added to the previous expansion, Treasures of Artugan, and in June of 2008, this saw the introduction of the Zeni Notorious Monster System. This was reminiscent of the Monster Arena from Final Fantasy X, but it was also similar to the progressive spawning system that led up to the encounter against Absolute Virtue. This system though revolved around Zeni, a new type of currency that could be used to purchase items that could spawn a new suite of notorious monsters. But it was not possible to go straight to the highest tier of notorious monster, similar to those aforementioned systems, players would first need to beat a tier 1 monster before being able to purchase a tier 2 spawn item. The system featured 5 tiers in total, and sitting at the top of the tree was a super boss that has now become infamous, Pandemonium Warden. The encounter against Pandemonium Warden was brutal. It would appear in one form before shifting to take on the form of other Artugar Notorious monsters such as Cerberus and Medusa. It would continue to cycle through many, many forms until settling back to its original form but all of them would need to be defeated in order to achieve victory. This meant that unlike previous super bosses, where they may have many forms that were thematic, here players would need to be familiar with how to fight against countless other pseudo super bosses as they would need to square off against each of them in what was essentially a massive gauntlet. Such was the brutality of the encounter that Final Fantasy XI started getting the wrong kind of mainstream media coverage. In response, the developers implemented a change that meant the Jader of Love, Absolute Virtue and Pandemonium Warden would despawn if not defeated within two hours. Each of these super bosses also had their attributes and abilities tweaked, but it wouldn't be until almost five months later that Pandemonium Warden was first slain. Following the success of the Final Fantasy III Remake, Square Enix were quick to greenlight a similar approach being applied to Final Fantasy IV, and alongside new visuals, an expanded narrative, voice acting, and a spruced up combat system, two new super bosses were introduced into the mix. The intriguing element here however was that neither super boss could be fought during an initial playthrough, instead players would need to make use of the New Game Plus feature and it was only during a subsequent playthrough that the super bosses would be accessible. However, even with this added barrier, there were still more hoops for the player to jump through. 
Final Fantasy XI introduced the notion of specific items being used to call forth powerful enemies, and the exact same approach was required to square off against Proto Babel. When fighting against Zero Mercy at the end of the game, players would need to make sure they stole the Dark Matter. This item could then be carried through into a new playthrough via New Game Plus, and if it was exchanged with a face on the moon's surface, the fight against Proto Babel would be initiated. With incredibly high attributes and over 400,000 HP, Proto Babel represented a real challenge when compared to Zeromus. And this was further emphasised by an ability called the Light of Babel, which could deal up to 9,999 damage unless strong enough armour was equipped and a defensive posture was adopted. Proto Babel also made use of a recurring trait associated with super bosses as it could cause instant death via its ninth dimension ability. And there were also numerous opportunities for it to counter with powerful abilities such as Object 199, which ignored defense to generally deal 9,999 damage. After enough damage had been dealt to Proto Babel though, it would change its stance and could then use Divine Judgment to deal incredible damage to the entire party. The other super boss, known as Gerion, did not require the party to steal and then use an item to encounter it, but it would only appear after the defeat of the four Archfiends. And this was because Gerion was connected with the Archfiends and could use all of their signature attacks throughout the encounter. Due to Gerion's enhanced attributes, each of these abilities had the potential to deal a considerable increase in damage, but the challenge posed was not on par with Proto Babel. That's not to say there weren't some intriguing aspects though, with perhaps the most interesting being that Gerion featured an adaptive routine, and this would come to the fore should the party be defeated, with Kane then instructed to jump. If this scenario occurred, Gerion would take advantage of the lull and self cast Inferno, as due to its elemental affinities, it acted as a powerful curative spell. Some years after the release of the Final Fantasy IV Remake, the same team produced a sequel called Final Fantasy IV The After Years. This featured two enemies that could be classified as super bosses, but instead of paying reference to any of the previous iterations of Final Fantasy IV, they pay reference to Final Fantasy V. Both Omega and the Nova Dragon, which served as a clear allusion to Shinryu, could be found inside the True Moon, the game's final dungeon. This, in itself, was a reference back to Final Fantasy V, as there, both Omega and Shinryu could be fought inside the interdimensional rift, that game's final dungeon. Each encounter was then reminiscent, with Nova Dragon having more HP but lower defensive attributes, and Omega having strong elemental affinities while still being weak to lightning. Their movesets were also similar, albeit expanded, with Omega using Wave Cannon, now called Surge Cannon, and the Nova Dragon using Tsunami to great effect. There were a few new elements added though, outside of new abilities, and one of them was an adaptive move from Omega. If the player used a Blue Fang, an item that dealt lightning damage, Omega would retaliate with Meltdown, an attack that dealt damage that was equal to Omega's current HP. Final Fantasy Tactics A2 was similar to its predecessor in that its hardest optional encounters were challenging, but not that challenging. It therefore means that while there were quite a few candidates for being pseudo super bosses due to their relative strength, such as the Sankular clan and those found within Bright Moon Tor, a bonus dungeon. However, perhaps the most interesting candidates have to be the Upsilon. Within the context of the game, there was a canonical narrative link between the Upsilon and Omega Mark XII from Final Fantasy XII. Scientists were attempting to recreate this mechanical monstrosity, and Upsilon A1 and Upsilon A2 were the result. The interesting adaptation, however, was that the notion of Omega was merged with that of Omega Weapon. Omega had often appeared as a standalone mechanical entity, but Omega Weapon often appeared as a biological life form that was connected with a weaker variant called Ultima Weapon. That variant relationship returned here, as Upsilon A1 was the weaker variant of Upsilon A2, and the latter was given a specific name, dubbed Magic Weapon. Similar to the original Tactics Advance, the encounter against Magic Weapon came via an optional side quest, 
but here it could only be accessed after finishing the final story quest and achieving rank 90 or above. Alongside its high HP and incredible stats, what made Magic Weapon a devilish encounter wasn't so much its abilities, but its range. Similar to other super bosses of the past, this meant Magic Weapon was seemingly able to operate outside of the confines of the established combat system, as it could attack the party from the other side of the map without any real fear of retribution. Players therefore needed to close the gap to stand any chance, which was easier said than done. This particular aspect then highlighted how much the concept of super bosses continued to evolve. Similar traits would recur with more frequency, but how they were implemented changed from game to game, and as more and more spin-offs were introduced, it allowed more novel interpretations to creep in. Perhaps the biggest innovation during this period, however, was the solidification of the multi-phase, multi-form, and multi-variant superbosses. Whereas previous superbosses had started to introduce phases, which would see the behavior of the superboss change as the encounter progressed, Final Fantasy VI Advance saw the Kaiser Dragon feature a plethora of different forms, with each form adopting a phase that was picked at random. The anniversary editions of Final Fantasy 1 and 2 then evolved this notion, as instead of featuring a single super boss that had multiple forms, they featured a super boss that had multiple separate forms, and they could each be fought against independently as opposed to one after another. This dynamic shift was pretty exciting, but we're only halfway through our journey of exploring super bosses, and within the next episode, which will start with the original Dissidia Final Fantasy before expanding to look at plenty of other games including the likes of Final Fantasy XIII, we'll see which trends continue to evolve and which faded away, while also exploring any new traits that were introduced as a way of ensuring the concepts stayed fresh. So be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell to make sure you are immediately informed when the next part is published, and make sure to let us know in the comments which has been your favourite super boss out of the ones we've covered in this video. Alright everyone with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube members and supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Gregory, Justin Dent and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.